نحمده ونصلي على رسول النبي الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إحدنا السراط المستقيم سراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين قال الله تعالى في شان حبيبي إن الله وملائكته يسلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا سلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل وسلم بارك على سيدنا ولا على محمد طب القلوب ودوائها وعافية الأبدان وشفائها ونور الأبسار وديائها وعلى آله وسهله دائما أبدا سلاة وسلام عليك يا سيدي يا رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last time uh, we were talking about uh, Ibrahim al Islam, and we'll continue with that today as well. And we were talking about his discussion or his uh, arguments, or religious arguments with Namrud. Uh, and and we, we tied that in with uh, Rasulullah you know, as far as the arguments, as far as giving life and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala giving life and causing death as well as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raising the sun from the east. And the challenge to Namrud, of course, was to raise it from the west, if he had any authority. Which, of course, he could not. You know, and as we said last time, you know, these arguments, you know, if somebody was able to do these, doesn't make him God. Uh, you know, if somebody, if, you know, of course, everything is through the power of Allah. Even when Dajjal comes, you know, he will raise the dead, uh, but again, that will be through the power of Allah because Allah SWT has granted him that. Uh, but it will be a test for the people you know, to see if they truly follow Allah and His Messenger وسلم, or they follow their own desires. And so the same thing with the argument about bringing the sun from the east or rather bringing the sun from the west. You know, Allah SWT gave Rasulullah SWT authority over all of creation. سَخَّرَ لَكُمْ مَا فِي السَّمَاوَاتِ وَمَا فِي الْأَرْضِ You know, that, that He has subdued everything in the heavens and in the earth you know, for Him. And so, you know, and we spoke about this, and I'm not going to go into the details and, and what we spoke about last time as far as, you know, the, the, the authenticity of the narration itself. You know, we've already spoken about that. Uh, but there are other things that we learn from this incident. You know, when Ali Radion was sitting there and Rasulullah came and laid his blessed head uh, on Ali Radion's uh, thigh, and then the sun, of course, went down and time for Asr passed, and Ali Radion has still not made his Asr. You know. This shows us the status of Rasulullah. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us through this because we have to never forget you know, we have to remember and we should never forget you know, that everything Rasulullah s.a.w. said is as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loved for him to say it you know, that he does, does not say anything from his own nafs or from his own desires or own self but rather everything that he says is nothing except Revelation. And also every action of Rasulullah Sallallahu is loved by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Everything he said is loved by Allah and everything he, he does is loved by Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so, Ali Radio is the one who is the faqih among the Sahaba Ikram. You know, his level of knowledge you know, is far superior uh, as far as the fiqh. Uh, and he is the door to that city of knowledge, which is, and the city of knowledge is Rasulullah himself. And so Ali Radha knows you know, the importance of Asr, 
the importance of salat itself, and then among salat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has, has uh, made a special mention of asr even in the Quran. And he knows this. And he knows the consequences of missing your salat. This is the man, we have to remember, who, when he made salat in such a way that when the arrow was stuck in his leg and they couldn't pull it out, what did he do? He started making salat and they pulled it out and he didn't even feel it. This is the father of the man who gave his head in asr to Allah. You know, Imam Hussein al-Islam in the field of Karbala, under all of those conditions, he did not miss his salat. Because that's the condition that he, he was martyred in, is he was in, in sajda in asr. So we have to remember all of this. And yet, you know, for the comfort and the honor of Rasulullah Sassam, he allows his asr to go. You know, because he understands that the comfort, the honor, you know, the respect and adab of Rasulullah Sassam uh, surpasses all other obligations. Every other obligation in Islam comes secondary to the honor and respect of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he does not even want, wish to disturb the Messenger of Allah. Because he also understands that the Messenger of Allah knows what is going on. Because we can't forget the famous uh, narration where Aisha Siddiqa Radiyan's friend came and they were talking while Rasulullah was laying there sleeping and snoring. Not just sleeping, but he was snoring. And after the woman, she, she left, Rasulullah he woke up and he told Aisha Siddiqa radiallahu everything that they had said. And she says to him, she says, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu you were sleeping. And he says that the eyes of the Prophet sleep, but their hearts never sleep. Yeah. And this gets into many other aspects, which I'm not going to go into right now. You know, because, you know, these are things that, that you know, we need to contemplate and ponder over so that we gain a better, a better understanding and, and there are other things that start coming you know, and other doors that Allah subhanahu wa starts to open when, you start, when we start to look at Rasulullah from this angle, or from this perspective. So this is one point of the understanding of Sayyidina Ali Karam Allah that we gain from this incident. But the other aspect of this is that, again, Rasulullah knew what was going on. He knew Ali had not made his asr. You know, he knows that the sun is going down because, again, the heart of the prophets never sleep. So they know. And yet he allows all of this to happen. And then, so Ali can make his salat, asr salat, he calls the sun back for him. Because he wants to teach the, the world the status of Ali, Karam Allah But if someone says, well, well, he did this, but again, Rasulullah doesn't do anything. Even the dua that he made, he doesn't say anything except for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to say. And he doesn't do anything except for what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants him to do. So if I try to say, oh, you know, well, why did Rasulullah allow this? Then the question comes in, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow this? Because again, they wanted to show the status of Sayyidina Ali, Karam Allah Waj. And so these, these are, you know, there are many, many lessons we gain from every aspect of the life of Rasulullah and everything that he did and said and, and you know, everything. You know, not a, every breath he took is a lesson for us. And so we need, to, we need to ponder over all of these things and think about them. But continuing from here, you know, as we mentioned last time, you know, you know the, the kingdom of Namrud is destroyed. You know, you know, he fights against this army of, of uh, uh, mosquitoes. Not even a significant insect. You know, and the one that kills him is the one that's even lame. You know, so we see, you know, we, we see all of these things and we should take lessons from all of these things. 
But after Ibrahim al-Islam, you know, he's ordered to leave. You know, so that the, then the punishment comes. As we said, the punishment never came while the Prophet was still there. They would be ordered to leave and then the punishment would come. And so he leaves with his nephew Lut al-Islam, who is the son of his older brother. And with his wife Bibi Sara, who is his cousin. And they go to Canaan. And Canaan at that time, uh, or some people pronounce it, or in English pronounce Canaan, or Canaan, uh, was what is modern day area of what, the West Bank, Gaza, uh, Philist Philistine, uh, parts of Jordan, Lebanon, parts of Syria, all of this was Canaan. And so he goes there and you know he goes from township to township preaching uh, with no positive response. And this is typical for the struggles of the prophets. Is we'll find that there, there will be some prophets of the 124,000 prophets of Allah has sent, more or less. You know, on the Day of Judgment, there will be, no, there will be some who have no followers with them at all. Yeah. And there will be some who only have a handful of followers. Uh, there will be some who have a decent number of followers. And of course, we know that Rasulullah will have the most followers. Uh, and it's something we'll talk about again later, inshallah. But he goes from township to township, you know, preaching the word of Allah and with no positive response. And this, you know, we have to also understand when he left uh, the kingdom of Namrud. At that time, Namrud was the king of the whole uh, known uh, civilized world. After Namrud, now you have other kingdoms that, that are popping up. And so he's in Canaan for a long time, preaching without any response. Uh, and then there's a famine and drought in Canaan, and so he leaves there uh, and he goes to Egypt. In Egypt, uh, or rather, you know, when he leaves, uh, he goes to Egypt, and in Egypt, uh, the, uh, but before he goes, you know, we get to the other thing, aspect, and that was one of the questions that I had asked. Uh, of the two questions that I had asked, uh, and this happens while he's in Canaan, uh, one was that, you know, Ibrahim al-Islam, he asked the question from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so the question is mentioned in Surah Baqarah, Surah number 2, verse number 260, where Ibrahim al-Islam, he says to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the verse starts off with, وَإِذْ قَالَ وَإِذْ Again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addressing the Rasulullah so and remember. Ibrahim Rabbi Arini Kaifatuhil Mauta. My Lord, show me you know how you you give life after death. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds. By saying, Awalam tu'min, that don't you believe? And Ibrahim al Islam responds by saying, Bala, of course I believe. But, walakin, but, you know, I want, litaskunu qalbi, you know, that I want satisfaction of the heart. You know, I believe this, but I want satisfaction of the heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He orders him to get four verbs. So he gets four birds, and there are various narrations as to what the four birds were. Yeah. But there were four birds. And he said to slaughter them, to set, and then chop them up, and lay parts of them on different hills. And mix them up, and lay parts here, parts there, different hills you lay parts on. And then he says, and then call them to yourself, and then see how they come. So Ibrahim al he does this, he chops them up, you know, slaughters them, chops them up, different, you know, feathers and everything mixed in together, everything is laid, laid out, you know, different parts and different hills, uh, and all of them mixed up. And in one narration, he keeps the four heads in, in his hand, and then he calls them. And then all of the parts, they start coming back together, you know, of, you know, each bird, each part of each bird is going to its own part. 
nothing's getting mixed up. And they all, then they come headless, coming, run, come running to him. And then when they come close, he hands one the head, of, the head of the other, and they reject the head. And then finally he gives each one its own head, and now they're back to life completely. So he sees this to satisfy his heart, even though he believes before. The verse before this, verse number 259, in, in verse 259, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about Uzair al-Salam, who is another prophet, you know, who as he's passing by this township, which actually happens to be Jerusalem, after it had been decimated and destroyed and, and, and leveled, you know, as he's passing by, he asks Allah, Allah, how will you give life back to this, daddy, this city after it's been dead? And, you know, I'm not going to go into that story right now because that's something we're going to talk about later. But he had to ask the question. We know Musa al Islam, he asked, well, Allah, show me yourself. You know, we have all of these great prophets, you know, Ibrahim al Islam, who's, you know, of, of all the prophets. You know, he is the greatest prophet of all the prophets, you know, after Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Millat Ibrahim Hanifa. Again, you know, the other prophets were on the path of Ibrahim, you know, who was righteous and pure. Yet he is asking Allah SWT, show me this. Musa al-Islam, such a great prophet, asking Allah SWT, show me yourself. You know, Uzair al-Islam, who is also a great prophet, asking Allah, sh why, show me this. How will you do this? Yet we don't find anywhere where Rasulullah Sallallahu asked Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, "Oh Allah, show me this." So the question is, why? Why not? And the answer comes, which we've talked about before, is Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala sent Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi as shahid. He is a witness. A witness to what? He is a witness to all of creation. You know, if you remember the definition of shahid, which uh, Allama. Uh, Raghib Asfahani rahmatullahi gave in his book Mufradat, which is the book that Imam Ghazali says that if we have any difficulty in understanding the terms of the Quran, this is the book that we will refer to, or we should refer to. He said, What? A shahid wa mina shahud wa shahadat. That shahid, witness, is from, you know, he tells the roots of it. And then he says, Mana hil huzur. You know, it means to be present. And if the one who is pre goes on to say that if the one who is present is not blind, then he also sees. He is seeing. He is present and seeing. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Rasulullah as a witness over all of creation. You know, he says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, verse number 41. فَكَيْفَ إِذَا جِئْنَا مِنْ كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ بِشَهِيدٍ وَجِئْنَا بِكَ هَاؤُلَا بِكَ عَلَى هَاؤُلَا إِشَهِيدًا How wonderful will it be or how will it be when we call from every witness or from every nation a witness meaning prophets will be witnesses over their nation and we call you وسلم, as a witness over them all in Surah Baqarah again, Surah number 2, verse 143, which starts off with, وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَتَلْ لَتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ وَيَكُونُوا الرَّسُولُ عَلَيْكُمْ شَهِيدًا you know, where he, Allah SWT is addressing the Ummah of Rasulullah so soon that we have created you or we have made you this balanced nation, you know, this middle median nation, this balanced nation, you know, because you will be a witness over all of mankind, and the messenger will be a witness over you all. Again, he is a witness. By definition, the witness is the one who is seeing and present. You know, if you go to court and the ask judge, you know, the judge asks you, you know, you go as a witness and the judge asks you, well, were you there? And you say no. And you say, well, did you see it? And you say no. He says, you know, what type of witness are you? Rasulullah is the first of creation. Nur in Abiyaka, his Nur is the first of creation. His Nur was created before everything else. And from his Nur was created the Qalam. Because when Allah created the Qalam, he ordered the, the, the pen to write. 
And the pen asked, what shall I write? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered it what? He said, write everything that is to happen and everything that has already happened. So if there was nothing that had happened before, there was no need to mention that. You know, which tells us that there was something that happened before, which is the creation of Rasulullah's Nur. And he also says in Surah Mulk, الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ He says that he created death and he created life. So these are also creations. So these are created after Rasulullah These are created in front of Rasulullah that he is seeing all of this creation. So he had no need to ask because he is a witness over everything. Whereas the prophets are witnesses over their nations. Their jurisdiction is over their nation, their, their respective nations. Rasulullah is has been sent for everything. That we have not sent you except as a mercy to all of creation. So if he is sent for all of creation, he is not only the, the messenger to mankind. He's not only the messenger to the Arabs, but all of mankind, and not just mankind, to all of jinkind, not just jinkind, to all of the angels, to all of the plants, to all of the animals, to all of everything, animate or inanimate. He is the messenger to everyone. He is the mercy to all of creation. So his jurisdiction covers everything. So, so he is a witness over everything. And this is why he does not need to ask. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already laid out everything in front of him. This is the status, or this is part of the status. We will never understand the status of Rasulullah but this is part of the status of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to take a glimpse into that, inshallah. So this happened while Ibrahim al Islam, you know, after he leaves the kingdom of Namrud. And then after this is when he leaves Canaan temporarily because of the drought. And then he goes to Egypt. You know, the king in Egypt was famous, you know, because he loved beautiful women. You know, this was his thing. And if any beautiful women were passing through his kingdom, you know, he would take them and put them into his harem. And if they were married, they would, he would execute their or have their husbands executed. Again, Sarah is also, he, she's the wife of Ibrahim al-Islam, but she's also his cousin. And so when they enter Egypt, because they had to leave Canaan because of, of the drought and situation, so they enter Egypt and they know this. And even though Bibi Sarah, she's older, but she's still a very beautiful woman. So, when they enter this, this, this area, you know, guards from the king, they see them coming and they go to them and they ask Ibrahim al-Islam, they say, who is she to you? And he says, she's my sister. You know, because he does a play on words. You know, if you, you know, in Semitic languages, and various other languages, the term for female cousin and sister is the same, as the term for male cousin and brother is the same. You know, they're interchangeable words. You know, just like ab, you know, for azar, uh, doesn't mean father physical, because ab also means father, but ab can also mean paternal uncle and, and other aspects. And so the same thing here. So, he says this, but also he can also he refers to it in another sense, in that she is the only believing woman and she is his sister in faith. Of course, they take it in the sense of, oh, she's his biological sister, so they brush him aside and they take capture her and they take her to the king, to the palace. Ibrahim al Islam, he follows them. And the king, you know, he, he places in her in his harem. But when he goes and he has any intention of doing anything bad, suddenly he goes paralyzed. Yeah. 
every time he intends on doing anything, he goes paralyzed. You know, his body goes numb, he can't, he can't numb, he can't move, and that's it. In the meantime, Ibrahim al Islam enters the palace you know, and starts talking to the king and actually preaching to the king. And over time, you know, Ibrahim al Islam comes back and forth, and over time, you know, the king starts making a connection uh, that maybe what he's doing is wrong. And he also becomes inclined toward the preaching of Ibrahim al Islam. And eventually, in, in various narrations, he eventually he accepts Islam and he accepts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, as one God. Uh, and when he does this, you know, he realizes the, the, the sanctity and the honor of Bibi Sara. So he frees her. Uh, he releases her from his harem. And when he does this, though, he also gives her a gift. And he sends with her Bibi Hajra. Bibi Hajra was also, she was a younger woman in his harem. And at this time, you know, many of the kings would exchange princesses to keep peace in, in the kingdoms. And this is how he acquired her. But the interesting thing about her also was that every time he intended on doing anything or, you know, uh, with any bad intention, the same thing would happen. His body would go numb and he would go paralyzed. And so he realizes you know, her, that she's also very special, so she gives her as a gift, or he gives her, he gives her as a gift to Bibi Sara, to take along, you know, with her. They join Ibrahim al-Islam and they make their way back to Canaan. Uh, so I will end this here today, uh, uh, because, the, you know, we're seeing different aspects of the life of Ibrahim al-Islam. The first aspect of his life, or first period of his life, is where he's in the kingdom of Namrud. You know, and then we see this second aspect in Canaan, you know, and then he goes to Egypt, which, which is a minor, which is a temporary aspect. I won't say a minor aspect because this is where Bibi Hajra comes in. You know, and then, but we see the sacrifice in everything that he's doing, uh, and then eventually now he makes his way back to Canaan. Uh, and so, inshallah, next time we'll start from here and, and start talking about this, inshallah. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina wa ala Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Sayyidina wa ala Muhammad wa ala Sayyidina wa ala Rabbana hablana abalana anfusana wa ilam tawfir lana wa tarhamna wa nikunna min al-khasirin Rabbana atana fi dunya hasanatan wa fi al-akhirata hasanatan wa kina adana min nar Rabbana aghfir li wa li walidaya wa li al-mu'mina yawmi wa li walidaya wa li al-mu'mina yawmi yaqoom al-hisab Ya Allah, guide us and, and Allow us to learn those things which are beneficial to us and allow us to, to uh, uh, try to understand the honor and status of your Habib Muhammad وسلم, and those who are close to him. Uh,